Once upon a time, there was a little locomotive that once ran on its own little railway through the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. That locomotive is East Tennessee and Western North Carolina Railroad number 12. And she is still around today, running excursion trains at the Tweetsie Railroad theme park in Boone, North Carolina. In a previous video, I took a trip to Tweetsie with my father, where I finally fulfilled my childhood dream of riding behind locomotive number 12. In that video, I mentioned that number 12 is the only survivor of the ET and WNC. But what happened to the rest of the railroad? Well, in order to know the railroad's end, we have to know its beginning. And in this video, I'm going to tell you all about it. My name is Nicholas Taylor, and this is the second part of my Tweetsie adventure. The year was 1866, and the Great Railroad Boom at the end of the Civil War was in full swing. This, combined with the discovery of iron ore, led to interest in building a railroad through the Blue Ridge Mountains. And after several years of construction, the line opened in 1881. The initial 14 miles of track began in Johnson City, traveling through Elizabethan before terminating at Hampton. This portion of the line was actually dual-gauged, meaning both standard and narrow-gauge locomotives could run on it. In 1882, an additional 19 miles of track was laid from Hampton through the beautiful Doe River Gorge and to the iron ore mine in Cranberry, North Carolina. Then, in 1916, the railroad would purchase the Linville River Railroad, another three-foot narrow-gauge railroad that ran from Cranberry to the isolated town of Boone, North Carolina. This gave the railroad a grand total of 66 miles of track. The townspeople had several nicknames for the railroad. One of these was the Railway with a Heart of Gold, as railroad personnel would often perform errands for the locals. It also had the nickname Every Time and with no complaints. But the most famous nickname for this little line was the Tweetsie, due to the shrill tweet tweet sounds that the locomotive's whistles made. Unfortunately, that affection from the people could not keep the railroad safe during a changing economy. During the Roaring Twenties, roads through the mountains would improve, and the newfound competition from trucking hurt the railroad's profits. Things would only get worse during the 1930s when the Great Depression hit. It was during this time that the ET and WNC gained another new nickname, the Eat Taters and Wear No Clothes. But jokes aside, the railroad would continue to live up to its nickname as the Heart of Gold, letting the poor locals ride the train for free. Unfortunately, while this was a good gesture from the railroad, it sadly made passenger services unprofitable and the railroad shut them down in the late 30s. In 1940, the Linville River Railroad was destroyed by heavy rains, and with no money to repair it, the line was abandoned, with most of it being subsequently turned into North Carolina Interstate 105. Now the railroad was back to where it started, only running from Johnson City to Cranberry, but even that seemed like it wouldn't last. Thankfully, there would be light at the end of the tunnel, but it would take one of the greatest tragedies in American history for the railroad to get there. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. 
the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. In 1941, Japan would attack the U.S. base at Pearl Harbor, and the next day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared that America would be joining the Allied powers in the Second World War. The War Board reinstituted passenger services between Cranberry and Elizabethan so that the railroad could carry ship workers to the bustling defense plants. This breathed new life into the railroad, making it one of the only lines to carry both freight and passengers during the Second World War. But while the war brought the railroad out of the tunnel, the end of the war in 1945 would sadly put them right back in. Unfortunately, the newfound business the railroad had did not hold up, and in 1950, the narrow gauge portion of the line was abandoned with all the narrow gauge tracks being pulled up in 1951. However, that's not the end of our story. As I previously mentioned, the initial 14 miles of track from Johnson City to Elizabethan were dual gauge, meaning both standard and narrow gauge engines could run on them. While the narrow gauge tracks were abandoned in 1950, the standard gauge portion of the line continued to run until 1983, when it was renamed to the East Tennessee Railroad as it no longer ran to Western North Carolina. The line continued to run under this name until 2003, when after 122 years of operation, the line finally closed for good, with the remaining track being turned into a bike trail in 2012. Although the railroad is now gone, the few artifacts we have ensure that it is not forgotten. Let's now go over what those are. So if you saw the first part of this documentary, you'll remember that I said locomotive number 12 was the sole survivor of the ETNWNC, and that is true. Number 12 is the only original locomotive from the ETNWNC still around. However, that was almost not the case. In 1952, locomotives number 9 and 11 were offered to the cities of Elizabethton and Johnson City as display pieces, but both cities foolishly rejected the offer, resulting in both locomotives being scrapped. However, the whistle of number 9 would be found, and in 2017, her voice would be heard again on 12's 100th birthday when her whistle was placed on Tweetsie Railroad's ex-White Pass and Yukon locomotive number 190. The two locomotives would subsequently perform a double header, making it the first time two ET and WNC whistles were blown together in decades. There is also locomotives 207 and 208, a pair of 1904 consolidations that the railroad bought secondhand from the Southern Railroad in 1952. While they weren't originally part of the ET and WNC, both locomotives were preserved and are still around. It's a long story and will be covered in its own video, but basically, in 1967, the two locomotives were traded back to the Southern for diesel locomotives 209 and 210. After being returned to their original colors and numbers, the locomotives began running excursions as part of the original Southern Railroad Steam Program. At the time of this production, 208 is awaiting restoration at the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad, while 207 is still operational at the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum in Chattanooga. In addition, Locomotive 210 is also at the Tennessee Valley, but is not operational. So that means there are four locomotives left from the ET and WNC, but three of these are secondhand locomotives that the railroad acquired from other railroads. Are there any original pieces of ET and WNC equipment that survived? Well, there are a couple pieces of rolling stock that are still around. One of these is Combine Car Number 15, an old passenger car that stuck with 12 through its time on both the Shenandoah Central and Tweetsie Railroad. 
Today, the car is being restored at the North Carolina Transportation Museum in Spencer, and it's the last passenger car from the ET and WNC that's still around. There's also this old caboose in Newland, North Carolina, as well as this old wooden boxcar that sits on display in Elizabethton, Tennessee, behind the old North American Rayon Corporation No. 1. This locomotive was built in 1936 for the NARC, working in the company's power plant in Elizabethton. This locomotive is quite unique as it does not have a conventional firebox. Instead, its steam is injected via a special device. This allowed the locomotive to run inside the factory without the risk of suffocating the crew. Technically, this is not an ET and WNC locomotive, but it did serve the ET and WNC, so I figured I'd mention it. And even though the narrow gauge portion of the tracks was torn up in 1951, that appreciation from the townspeople ensured that the railroad couldn't stay dead forever. In the 1960s, 2.5 miles of rail were relayed along the old right-of-way through the Doe River Gorge portion of the line, and trains would begin running there again as part of the now-defunct Hillbilly World Amusement Park in Hampton, Tennessee, which ran until 1974. In 1987, the property was acquired by the newly established Doe River Ministries, who began slowly restoring the tracks over the course of many years. Finally, in the early 2000s, the railroad began operations as the Doe River Gorge Scenic Railroad. They started off running motor car operations as part of their Adventure Quest program, but in 2004, the railroad acquired a 1977 Plymouth Diesel locomotive, as well as some passenger cars from Six Flags Over Georgia that they could run actual excursion trains with. Then, in 2014, the railroad acquired a 1964 Crown Metalworks steam locomotive, which they subsequently restored to operation in 2021 as ET and WNC number 15. In April 2021, I took a trip with my father to Tweetsie Railroad, where I finally fulfilled my childhood dream of riding behind locomotive number 12. After the trip, Dad and I made a trip over to Elizabethton, Tennessee to visit family up there. Before we left for home, I dropped by the Doe River Gorge Scenic Railroad. They weren't open on the day, and I didn't charter a train, so my intention was just to get some pictures of the equipment and leave. However, sometimes things don't always go according to plan. On the day I went, there were some news reporters doing a story on the railroad. They were going to get a motor car ride along a small portion of the gorge. I guess I was in the right place at the right time because the conductor asked me if I wanted to tag along, and of course, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. Our journey began at tunnel number two, a hand-cut tunnel that serves as the gateway into the gorge. And let me tell you, once we were through that tunnel, I felt like I was in a whole new world. We stopped at Padres Point where we got to admire the river and the scenery. This is the only even ground on this portion of the railroad and the ministry often hosts weddings out here. All I can say is I know where I'm getting married. Once we were done getting our photos, it was time for us to head back. We rode in the front this time, meaning I got a front row seat of the whole railroad. On the way back, we passed by my favorite spot on the whole railroad. It reminds me so much of the Durango and Silverton in Colorado, which is my favorite tourist railroad of all time. Eventually, we came to tunnel number three, another hand-cut tunnel along the gorge. After that, we were on our way back to the ministry. Prior to this trip, I was telling my dad that the fact that the ET and WNC wasn't preserved as a tourist railroad is one of the biggest missed opportunities in railroad preservation, and this ride proved my point. 
So that's the story of the E.T. and W.N.C. Railroad and the second part of my Tweetsie adventure. I really want to thank the reporters of WJHL Channel 11 Johnson City for making this day possible. I'll leave a link to their story in the description below. I also want to thank the railroad staff for inviting me on the ride. You guys really made my day, and I'll definitely be back another time. At the time of this production, the railroad is currently investing $7 million on a Christmas train project. If you want to contribute to the project, I will also include a link to their website in the description below. This video is not sponsored by either party in any way. I just really love this railroad and I want to see it succeed. Most of all, I want to thank my dad for going on this adventure with me. There's still a great number of adventures to be had across these two railroads. But for right now, I think it's time to focus on other adventures. My name is Nicholas Taylor, and for now, this is the end of my Tweetsie adventure.